Today, Voices from Oxford is in the beautiful gardens of Balliol College, uh, where it's a beautiful sunny day. And we're also going to be talking to somebody very interesting who came uh, to this country about 15 years ago. This is Dr. Brian Ball, who is a lecturer in philosophy at the college. And Brian, what I want to do in this interview is to ask you, first of all, some rather general questions to justify your existence as a philosopher. <laughs> because um, I've, I've noticed the fields of philosophy in which you work, and they're quite varied, aren't they? Yes. And the natural question that's going to come to the viewers of this programme is, what, for example, has something called epistemology got to do with me. Yes, right. Can you answer that? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, um, so epistemology is basically the theory of knowledge. Yes. Um, and so it asks questions like, first of all, what is knowledge? Can we have any of it? Are there limits to what we can know? Yeah. Uh, and what makes the difference between mere opinion and, and, and knowledge? And um, crucially, if that difference is important, how can we uh, ensure that we get <laughs> knowledge rather than mere right. Uh, right. opinion? Yes. Um, and I mean, I think those questions are deeply important questions. Uh, one, just one little example of, um, that I think illustrates both the kind of moral uh, significance and the sort of practical significance of um, uh, having some um, awareness of uh, epistemic issues or epistemological issues uh, is, comes from the following uh, series of experiments that were done um, with, with college students. Right. So um, college students were put into small groups um, asked, and asked to pretend that they were uh, hiring committees given a right. list of uh, curriculum vitae for yes. various candidates yes. uh, who were supposed to be the sort of short list and then they were meant to select a, a candidate as the person who they would have wanted to offer the, the job to on the basis of their CVs. And um, unbeknownst to these students, each group basically got the same CVs but with the names uh, at the top of the CVs ah. uh, changed. Yes. Um, and right. so afterwards the, the, the groups of students were asked why they chose the yes. CV that they did and so yes. on. And of course they pointed to various features uh, listed yeah. on, the, on the CVs. But yeah. if you look at the statistics of what happened, uh, in fact, they were choosing um, in large part based on the name. The name. Uh, and see. in particular, they were dis discriminating basically against names that sounded like they were the names of black persons yes. uh, or names of women. Yes. Uh, right? okay. so, and these are, of course, uh, liberal-minded, right. well-educated college would, students who would not, uh, normally who would not think, think of themselves as making those discriminations. Be, yes, exactly. And so it's very, very yes. important, right? Yes. Uh, both if you want to get the right person for the job yes. <laughs> and also yes. um, if you want to uh, uh, give it people an equal and fair yes. chance, yes. right, uh, that you, in fact, pay some attention to what the basis yes. for your judgment uh, yes, about Yes. for example, who would be the best candidate for the job yes. uh, is, right? So these questions are quite important. I think. So that's a very interesting example because, uh, d correct me if I've got this wrong, but it sounds as though you're saying that, first of all, asking a philosophical question like, what is knowledge mm -hmm. and how do you come to have it? And can you be reasonably certain that knowledge is all you're basing your view on? Yes you're saying that could lead to an experiment, an actual investigation in the world, an empirical experiment, that then leads to answering a question. It can tell us about what knowledge is and so on, yes. but it is uh, the case that uh, philosophers do, and epistemologists do try to put forward hypotheses uh, about, for example, what it is to know something uh, yes. and which processes yes. yield knowledge, um, which might very well, uh, um, through careful uh, right. scientific practice, to end up with an experiment yes. that uh, could make a distinction of that. But that leads us to a very fundamental question too about science, doesn't it? Which is that if what you've described there is correct, then uh, an experimental scientist ought to be asking himself or herself, sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> the question, you know, <laughs> is the way I am viewing this, is the way in which I'm dividing the world up right. the only way in which I could do that? Is that a fair way of putting it? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's something right about that way of putting it, at least. Um, so. Uh, one of the other areas I work in is metaphysics, right? We've mentioned epistemology, right. but I also work in metaphysics, and metaphysics is, um, roughly speaking, concerned with what uh, reality is like in and of itself, right? Yes. Quite independently yes. of how we happen to yes. uh, believe it to be or represent it as being uh, in our thought or in our talk. 
Um, and uh, I do think that getting clear on um, on what a given phenomenon is that we're targeting if with our theorizing is quite important um, mm. for uh, scientific purposes, in fact. Um, so just, uh, for example, another area that I work is philosophy of language. Um, uh, if you look at uh, what people do when they speak to each other, right, one of the things that they do, of course, is that they communicate their thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, and there are interesting questions about how we succeed in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at uh, the development over sort of the 20th century and into the 21st century of um, thinking about this, uh, early on uh, in, say, the 1930s, people, uh, linguists, tended to think of what they were investigating as just physical sounds, right? The noises right, that come okay. out of people's yes. mouths. Yes. Um, but uh, one of the things that Noam Chomsky did uh, starting in the late 50s was to suggest that that couldn't be right. So here's a kind of consideration, I think, that, that um, illustrates that. So take uh, visiting relatives can be boring, right? Yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's ambiguous, right? It can mean that the process of going to visit relatives can be boring, and it can mean that relatives who come to visit are boring. Can be boring. <laughs> yes. um, and so yes. the standard sort of explanation of how it can, how that noise can have those two meanings is mm. uh, to say, well, there are two different uh, syntactic structures yep. uh, in, that, in that noise, uh, and that of course, what it is that has the syntactic structure is a sentence, right? The sentence mm. has a syntactic structure. So there's, in fact, two sentences here, mm. uh, but just one noise. Just that shows that the sentences can't be the noise, because no, no, right, no one thing is two things. Well, one thing I'd love to follow up on mm. with that, Ryan, because I, I'm thinking here, you see, a little bit like a scientist, mm -hmm. because, um, you see, I think there's a very good example in biology of this problem of meaning attached to sequences. And that yes. word already gives you an indication of what I'm getting at. Yes. Can a gene be selfish? <laughs> uh, that's a super uh, difficult question. Um, so, and a very interesting one. I mean, um, so, I mean, one kind of question is about what selfishness is in general uh, and whether mm. it truly contrasts with, say, altruism, right? Um, yes, one, indeed. One kind of, of big issues. One kind of strategy for explaining how there could be altruistic behavior is by showing how it's not really unselfish to be indeed. altruistic, indeed. In, effectively. Yes. And yes. I guess I'm sympathetic to that yeah. to that line. Um, yeah. So, uh, of course, if you mean by selfish uh, something mm. that's decidedly not altruistic, yeah. prioritizes your own advantage above yes. others, then I think probably you won't go for that sort of explanation. Yeah. Yeah. But in fact, in biology, right, a lot of explanation is uh, game theoretic, right? Yes. Um, yes. And so too are other explanations in other fields. Uh, for example, David Lewis put forward a kind of game theoretic story about how mm. linguistic communication is right. uh, possible. He viewed um, uh, a kind of a speech situation as a um, as a game. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and right. uh, one can pursue strategies in that game and so on. And now, yes. here's the thing that I think is interesting about this, for you and I, of course, we can deliberately pursue strategies in a right. game, intentionally do so. Yes. Genes don't seem Cult to be the kinds of things that can yeah, have intentions, right? Yes. right? They're not sophisticated <laughs> enough for that. They're very sophisticated yeah. things, but they're Indeed. not sophisticated enough to yes. have intentions. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. what is it, basically, to uh, play a game and pursue a strategy uh, if you don't have a mind? <laughs> That's well, a very difficult that, question, but that, there must be that, some answer. Well, that leads me to the, the final question that I very want good. to put to you, yeah, uh, uh, Ryan, because do we have a mind and what do we mean by saying <laughs> we have a mind? <laughs> yeah, so that's also a very good question. Um, so I do think that we are uh, at least minded, let's put it that way, okay. um, whether there is such a thing as the mind. Well, either more skeptical about or um, less interested in depending on uh, how robustly you mean in to say this, that. In the sense that you wouldn't know where to find it, is that a good way to put the <laughs> question of whether there is or is not a mind? Uh, I mean, there is a very good question about, and a hotly debated uh, yeah. question in, in philosophical circles um, in particular, about whether mm. in some sense the mind is located inside the skull. Uh, or not, yes. right? Yes. Um, right? So there are people who think, uh, of course, uh, psychological explanation deals with uh, mental representations, and those mental representations are somehow or other implemented in our brains and so on. Mm. Um, others, on the other hand, suggest that uh, it can't be that that kind of so-called internalist picture of the mind is right, that the mind right. can't be um, pinpointed as located really inside the skin, yeah. uh, and they point to considerations like this. Um, 
if I think something, mm. uh, then what I think might be true or false, depending on how things are in the world, mm. right? So suppose, um, for example, that uh, I think that water is wet, very sort of trivial mm. thought, <laughs> mm. right? One that many will accept. But now people think, well, look, my thought is about H2O, right? We know what water to be H2O, yeah. right? But we can imagine somebody who's an, a duplicate of me mm. from the skin inwards, basically, mm. Mm. on another planet somewhere mm. across the universe, uh, engaging with some other substance, not H2O, but mm. superficially like it. Mm. Uh, and using the word water to talk about that and um, uh, thinking about it when they think the kinds of thoughts that they express by saying water is wet. Um, mm. but their thought will not be true just in case H2O is wet. Their thought right. will be true just in case that substance is wet. Indeed, yes. So they will be thinking something different yes. uh, than I will be thinking yes. when I think water is wet because right. my thought is true if and only if right. H2O is wet. Yes. So the, thought, the basic idea of this yeah. argument is to say, look, our thoughts Mm. Right, what they are, what what properties they have, and so on, like whether they're true, for example, um, mm. our thoughts are individuated mm. by factors outside of yes. our skins, yes. and so our minds yes. can't really depend only on features. Well, what's inside here? Physical features inside our skin. Yes. They must, in fact, yes. depend on our environment as well, uh, yes. which um, is not entirely surprising because you think. Uh, what, it, what biological evolutionary advantages there in being in minded, partly it's to engage with your environment in productive ways. Okay, right? Social interaction. Yes. Social and, yes. and natural interaction. I mean, yes. even yes. non-social creatures. Of course, uh, indeed. Do so. Bacteria do it. <laughs> quite, though I'm not sure I want, want to say that a bacterium is, is in minded. Uh, okay, well, we won't pursue that one. I don't think we need to in this particular right, right. interview. But right, thank you very much oh, indeed for bringing please. some very, very difficult philosophical questions. Yeah. to a general audience to see sure. that, first of all, just to summarize very briefly, that they can have extraordinarily important practical implications, like your experiment yes. uh, on, the, on the students, yes. um, and also tackling some very fundamental questions about what we are as humans. Well, Am I quite. right? Yes, exactly right. I mean, uh, yes. uh, my own sense is that uh, philosophy is, uh, roughly speaking, an investigation of the human condition. Indeed. Uh, and, yes. uh, the various branches that I work in, philosophy of language, epistemology, mm. metaphysics, philosophy of mind that we've talked about, yeah. uh, all contribute to, that, to yes. that project. And thanks for the discussion. Well, it's our pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for talking to Voices sure. from Oxford. Cheers.